the organizers very much for inviting me here today and all of you for waking up so early on a Saturday morning. Um, so I'm going to be talking about sort of macroscopic scale dark matter or dark matter clumps. One example might be topological defects and how we can search for the transient effects of such objects as they pass through the Earth using global networks of precision devices. So in particular, we use the GPS constellation as a 50,000 kilometer diameter uh, detector. Um, and in, within our initial search, we have placed limits on walls of dark matter just because they're the easiest things to look for at first. And for certain models, uh, we place limits that are uh, orders of magnitude more precise than the existing constraints. Uh, then at the end, I'll talk about how we plan to move forward to both increase the sensitivity and to move to look for uh, a more diverse set of models. Uh, so a very quick motivation. So WIMPs, as we all know, are long-time favorite uh, dark matter candidate. However, many null results have partly led to an increased interest in other potential models for dark matter. Uh, one of these is ultralight boson fields. So, for example, axions are probably familiar with. Uh, these are fields with extremely low masses. And they may form coherent oscillating fields, uh, sort of classical fields, or they may form stable uh, large-scale objects, for example, topological defects. Uh, so I will mention that uh, while I talk about topological defects, uh, these methods and the results are, are more general and they apply to any kind of dark matter clumps. Uh, but to write down a limit, we need to write down something. So we're interpreting the results now in terms of topological defects because uh, there's already literature on this. So, um, so in general, uh, if you think of topological defects, you can have sort of zero D objects, a monopole, you can have a string, the main wall. Uh, and then in general, the characteristic size of these kind of objects is given by the Compton wavelength. So, so inversely proportional to the mass. And if these objects exist, it's possible that they can contribute to dark matter density. So you can think of a sort of gas of these clumps uh, throughout the galaxy. Um, so if these objects exist, hopefully they have appreciable interactions with standard model particles. So one option, for example, is pseudoscalar portal or so-called axion-like portal. And, and this leads to, um, this is an interaction with fermion spins. Uh, which is like magnetic field kind of interactions, uh, magnetic-like interactions. So you can search for these using uh, magnetometers. And the GNOME experiment uh, is an experiment that's sort of up and just starting to get running now, which is very similar to our approach, but they're using a sort of global network of magnetometers uh, on the Earth. Um, what we focus on, however, is the quadratic scalar portal. And so this is a coupling that leads to effective transient variations in certain fundamental constants. And so these uh, transient variation in fundamental constants will lead to shifts in atomic energy levels and therefore shifts in transition frequencies. Uh, so you can search for these kind of effects using atomic clocks. Um, so you can write down, for example, quadratic scalar coupling. And you'll see that this leads to effective additions to uh, the apparent values of certain fundamental constants. Um, so this addition uh, is only non-zero when the field value is non-zero, which is only inside the topological defect or the, the dark matter clump, which is why these effects will be transient. Uh, and so the uh, shift in the fundamental constant will lead to a shift in the transition frequency and to make this link, we need atomic structure or nuclear structure calculations. But these calculations are relatively mature field, and they already exist. Uh, so we can just plug in those numbers. Um, the point being that we can then link the observable, which is a shift in the frequency, back to the parameters of the dark matter field. Um, so to do the experiment, we need to have a clock comparison. Uh, so we always have one clock, which is the reference clock, and we're comparing other clocks to that. Uh, and generally, so we, when the uh, dark matter clump is interacting with the atomic clock, it might make it run slightly faster or slightly slower, which will cause initially synchronized clocks to become desynchronized. So that's the general signal that we're looking for. Um, of course, in reality, it looks something more like this. So the question then is, how do you determine a true transient from just regular background clock noise? And the answer that we have is to use a global network of atomic clocks. And we're lucky because such a network already exists in the GPS constellation. So the GPS has about 32 uh, satellite clocks, which are either rubidium or cesium microwave clocks. 
There's also a large number of earthbound clocks, some of which are very stable hydrogen mazes. And we have uh, 16 years of data that from JPL, and this data is publicly available. If you've got a spare terabyte, you can download it now. Uh, and so this data is sampled every 30 seconds, and depending on which clock we're talking about, at a precision of around 0.1 to 0.01 nanoseconds. Um, so I've got a little video that one of our undergraduate students made. So what we're looking for is a correlated propagation of blips as uh, an object passes through uh, the constellation. Uh, we're kind of proud of his image. Like this, uh, the velocities and the size of the satellites is not to scale, obviously, but uh, the actual positions of the satellites are real positions from January 2007 or something, so we thought that was kind of neat. Right, so if you uh, imagine just a single clock, and there's two clocks here, but I'll talk about a single clock. Yeah? Question there, when you say the speeds are not to scale, can you neglect this, the movement of the satellite? Yeah, we can. So uh, in this case, um, so the satellites are on 12-hour orbits. Um, so they're, they're going at about four kilometers per second, whereas the, the dark matter object is kind of galactic speed, several hundred kilometers a second, yeah. So, so what, if what, if, what if we were just unlucky and we had a, a very slow dark matter object? Uh, it, it's possible. Um, so generally speaking, like if the dark matter objects in the galaxy themselves are very slow, then the relative velocity is set by the Earth. Uh, if you're just very unlucky and it's going at sort of the same speed as the Earth, then that would be harder to detect. Um, but, you know, making some assumptions on the general velocity distribution of these things, um, we can take that into account. And so, you know, if there's just one, then, yeah, it's, it's going to be much more difficult to detect, but hopefully there's more than one. Um, so here is a, a general signal for one clock. And again, I say one because we always have to uh, have one as the reference clock. So as we're observing this one clock as a dark matter object comes through, in this particular example, it's increased the frequency just while the interaction was happening. And then as that dark matter object passes through your reference clock, it appears then uh, from the point of view of the first clock that the frequency gets a bit lower. Um, so here is the signal for one clock, and if we transpose that over to a network, every row here is one of the, say, 30 satellite clocks. And so the red tiles are where the dark matter object has hit individual clocks. And when the dark matter object passes through your reference clock, you get this uh, opposite perturbation for all the clocks in the network simultaneously. <coughs> and you'll notice that there's a couple of clocks here that don't have a signal. That's because we have only 30 second sample data. So any clock that is passed within the same 30 seconds as the reference clock won't show up any uh, signal. But generally speaking, that's a small proportion of the satellite, so it's not a big problem. Yes, so we, we treat the, the density of the objects as one free parameter. Um, yeah. Uh, and so we have 50,000 kilometers uh, diameter network and a couple of hundred kilometers per second velocity, so this total interaction time is on the order of a minute or so. Um, so now I will quickly introduce uh, what we call the tiled representation of the data. This will just help us explain how we do the data analysis uh, at the first step. Uh, so at the top here is a couple of hours of actual GPS clock data for a few randomly chosen clocks. And we just apply some cutoff, and any uh, outlier that's above a certain cutoff comes down here as a red blip, and any outlier that's below the negative of this value comes down as a blue blip. Uh, and so this kind of signals that I was showing before, what we do is we scan through all the data and try and find regions of the data which uh, can be consistent with these kind of signals. So for a first step, we don't take into account the order in which the satellites were hit, which would uh, correspond to the direction in which some object was coming from, so we're looking for just the most general signals. And we systematically reduce that cutoff value until we can no longer rule out the data. So as an example, here's one particular data window with a cutoff of 0.18 nanoseconds, and here it's clear that there is no event inside the data. When we reduce down to 0.13, then uh, at our first step, we can't, uh, we can't rule this kind of thing out. Um, in actual fact, this is not a dark matter signal, unfortunately. Uh, the, the perturbation for the reference clock is systematically a lot larger than the perturbations for the other clocks. Um, but for our first round of analysis, we are happy to accept the large number of false positives just to place a constraint uh, as the first step. Um, so once we've scanned through the data, we can uh, try to place limits. And to do this, we have a three-dimensional parameter space. And so here, lambda is oh, the effective energy scale 
Uh, it's essentially just in the, the inverse square of this you can think of as the coupling strength. And T, which we talk about, is the uh, average time in between consecutive collisions, which is related to the number density of the objects in the galaxy. Uh, and D here is the characteristic size of the objects, which uh, if you're assuming topological defects is related to the Compton wavelength, but we treat it at itself as a free parameter. And here is the, the density you were asking about a second ago, so, uh, which depends if you assume, for example, that the objects make up a significant proportion of the dark matter, then we can link the density uh, inside each object to the number density. Uh, but in general, uh, that's only true if you assume it's dark matter. Uh, and just briefly, of course, we're not equally sensitive to every part of the parameter space, but we can take things into account, for example, how quickly the clocks will respond to a perturbation, which gives us a limit on the smallest uh, objects that we can look for at the moment, and then other aspects of our uh, search technique to work out which region of the parameter space we are sensitive to at a 90% confidence level. So actually scanning through the data, what do we see? Well, we can rule out any of these kind of events at the half a nanosecond level. So again, I'll just uh, reaffirm. So at the moment, we're looking for walls of dark matter. So while it, it may not be everybody's favorite candidate, at the moment, it's by far the easiest thing to look for. It just leaves the simplest data. So for walls, we don't see anything above the half a nanosecond level uh, with 16 years of total observation data, which allows us to place constraints. Um, so here is our constraint from, that comes from the rubidium network of clocks. And uh, I put here as uh, uh, the constraints on the effective energy scale. And I say effective energy scale because the actual couplings that we have, uh, there's more than one kind of coupling. So in particular, they're parameterized in terms of variations of fundamental constants. And it depends on the variations on the fine structure constant, the electron and proton masses, and the quark masses. And if you have a different atom, it will uh, change depending on a different linear combination of these parameters. So to make life simple, we, uh, for the first sweep, are treating the rubidium clocks and the cesium clocks as sort of separate networks. Um, this doesn't have too much of a negative impact, though, because essentially the GPS is a rubidium clock network. There's not too many cesium clocks, particularly in recent times. Um, but so our limits here, our constraints go up to the 10 to the 7 TV level. And until very recently, the constraints from uh, astrophysics were, were down at the 10 TV level. So it's a significant improvement. Um, so if we assume that one of those couplings I was talking about a second ago uh, is dominant, then we can place individual constraints. So assuming the coupling to electromagnetism, which uh, shows up in a variation of the fine structure constant, is dominant, then we can place constraints on this coupling. And these are our limits here in yellow compared to uh, limits from an optical strontium clock in green. So this was, these optical strontium limits were placed very recently by a group in Poland. And they use a single optical strontium clock and with about 12 hours of data to place their constraints. Um, so a couple of things. With optical strontium clocks, of course, they are substantially more accurate than the cesium or rubidium microwave clocks. Um, but they only have sensitivity due to atomic physics to the coupling to electromagnetism to the variation in the fine structure constant whereas microwave clocks also have sensitivity to variations in fermion masses. Um, also, because they have to run their experiment in a lab, they can take about 12 hours of data. So if one of these objects, say, comes once a week or once a year, of course, they're not going to see anything, which is why our limits uh, stretch past to the, the parameter space here is the average time between collisions. So uh, we can always gain uh, several order of magnitude in this direction here. Um, the red line on the top is projected sensitivity. So the reason it's squiggly is because we have to have different clock networks for the different uh, characteristic times in between events. So the, the very top one here is assuming we can run a few of these optical strontium clocks for about a month. And this is, in fact, the same projection that they uh, put forward in their paper. And then above that time scale, we're, we're limited by the best GPS clocks, and then above that, the worst GPS clocks. And this dotted line here is microwave uh, laboratory clocks, which, while they're never going to be as precise as optical clocks, they do have sensitivity to the different kinds of couplings. Um, so as well as the limits on uh, variation of fine structure constant, we can place limits on variation of electron, proton, and uh, quark masses. So there's two regions here. In the first region uh, is the same as before, where we have to assume the relative couplings are the dominant ones. 
Uh, however, we can do something a little bit more strong than that because we now have one limit from the rubidium network of GPS clocks, uh, one from the cesium network, and one on the variation of fine structure constant from the optical strontium clock. So we have three different uh, limits that depend on three different combinations, uh, three different linear combinations of the three kinds of couplings. So we can use that to separate the limits. And if we do that, then we can place these limits on the uh, electron proton masses and the quark coupling uh, that are independent of this assumption. Um, of course, here we're limited down to the about half a day uh, time range because of the optical strontium clock experiment. Um, so I mentioned that our limits were, I mean, we didn't find evidence for events above the about 0.5 nanosecond level. I also mentioned that the atomic clocks on the satellites were accurate to 0.1 or 0.01 nanoseconds. So we're still well above the noise floor, and that's just because of our simplistic search technique and the fact that the, the clocks have you know, strange uh, jumps and things like that. So the question is, how do we go further than this, and how do we improve the results? And also, we were only looking for walls, and it would be nice to look for monopoles and strings and other kind of clumps. Uh, and to do this is just uh, harder in terms of data analysis. Um, so the way we plan to do this to use a Bayesian analysis technique. So we form likelihood uh, functions using a Gaussian likelihood. We've got the covariance of the clocks here, et cetera. It's not so important. The point is uh, uh, doing this kind of thing, we can marginalize or integrate out all the free parameters. Uh, in our case, it's like the time of collision, the velocity the object was going at, what direction it came from, et cetera. And so forming these likelihoods ratios, we can form odds ratios and plug them through the whole data. And we expect to see spikes in these functions uh, around regions of the data that can match a potential uh, signal. And uh, doing this kind of technique, we should be able to get down just below the noise of the clocks uh, by a factor of square root n, where n is the number of clocks that we have. Of course, that's the best case scenario, but it's still uh, quite a lot better than what we are doing currently. So, of course, we need to test this kind of technique. It's a bit strange. And uh, we don't want to put any real data through the code while we're still writing the code, in case we bias how we write the code. So instead, what we do is we form power spectrums from the real data. So we have one different power spectrum for each individual GPS satellite. And using these power spectrums, we can uh, essentially simulate um, GPS clocks. So we have a GPS simulator that sort of randomly sprays satellites around the uh, constellation and feeds them with fake, uh, with fake data where the noise that we generate matches the noise characteristics of the real data. And just to briefly show that that works, on the left here is some actual atomic clock data, on the right is simulated data. And it doesn't just look the same. Below that <coughs> is uh, autocorrelation function and calculated Allen variance. It's a little bit hard to see, but there is a pink line and a blue line here where the blue line is the actual atomic clock data, the pink line is our simulated data, and they match exactly the same. So with this, uh, with this sort of simulated GPS network, we can do two kinds of tests. We can inject fake events into the fake data and see how well we can pick them out, and we can also not inject any events into the data to try and get a handle on what kind of false positive rate we will see. Uh, so I have one undergraduate student who's uh, sitting in an office somewhere cranking these simulations and obviously it's not finished but it uh, the moment is looking very promising so that's good. So when we plug the whole uh, actual GPS data through the, uh, through the code there's a couple of things that might happen. The best case scenario is that we might see a few very good candidate events or many good candidate events. Uh, in this case, they will have good odds ratios, good likelihoods functions, and then we can go in and uh, examine these candidates in more detail. We can go back to the original NASA data and generate. Um, so at the moment, uh, the GPS data is sampled every 30 seconds. But if you go back to the original um, phase data that they have, you can actually uh, generate data that's sampled every one second because it's, it's just com computationally intensive to generate the clock solutions. Uh, but we can go back and do that if we find any regions of particular interest. Also, because we know exactly what time these kind of events came through, if there were other precision experiments that happened to be running at the same time, uh, we can go and check to see if they saw anything weird at the same time. Uh, of course, the other option is that we don't see anything. 
Uh, and in this case, immediately we can place constraints. Uh, but then the question is, that, is that all we can do? And it's possible if you imagine, for example, that there are a large number of uh, small events, we can continuously sort of lower the threshold of what we consider to be a potential event. And of course, by doing this, we will be greatly increasing the number of false positives. But we may also be increasing, we may also be finding some true positives that are hiding down in amongst the noise. So can we do anything in this case? And there's a, there's a few things that might help here, which is if the, there are actual dark matter events, we would expect them to all have the same sign, whereas false positive events would have random signs, you would assume. So by sign here, I mean whether or not they perturb the clocks to be faster or slower. Um, but also, we have very good velocity and directional resolution because of the large number of clocks in the network. So we, uh, we would expect real events to follow roughly velocity distribution uh, of standard Halo model. Now, of course, uh, this on the left here is the velocity distribution, and this would be uh, a little bit harder for us to, um, to resolve. Uh, because if events are very fast, it, it's problematic in the data analysis and very slow is problematic, as was mentioned. Uh, however, the directionality is, is, a, is, a more, um, is a nicer signal. So you would expect more than 90% of the events to come from the forward-facing hemisphere uh, if they're true, true events, just because of the velocity of the Earth and the Sun through the, uh, through the galaxy. Um, and also, because we have a large number of clocks, it's very easy for us to resolve uh, what direction one of these objects would have come through, because it depends on which clocks we hit first and last. Um, so this, this may well be a, a very nice signal to look for in the case where there is a large number of events. Um, a little bit harder, might, we may, uh, if there's a very large number of events, also uh, be able to see annual modulations. So we would expect to see an annual modulation in the event rate an annual modulation in the average velocity, and also an annual modulation in the most common incident direction. Um, of course, these are, these are much smaller effects, so they'll be harder to see, but they may extend the, uh, the potential reach um, for our method in the case when there are a very large number of events. So in the case when the time between events is much smaller than a year. And also when uh, the size of the object is much smaller than the uh, diameter of the GPS network, and they might not be hitting every clock then this might give us some other signals that we can possibly look for in the data. Um, so I've got some references. I think the clocks, the uh, slides will be online. So just to conclude, uh, we're looking for topological defect dark matter or dark matter clumps. Uh, using GPS as a 50,000 kilometer diameter dark matter detector, we've placed limits on certain wall dark matter models that are many orders of magnitude uh, more precise than existing limits. And looking forward, we have a Bayesian search technique that we're uh, just developing that will allow us to search for uh, signals below the noise floor and also signals of monopoles and strings and more general objects. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the techniques that, we're, that we've managed to develop are relatively general. And we're applying them now to atomic clock data from the GPS. But in general, uh, any kind of archived precision experiment data might have some very you know, interesting kind of signals in it. The idea being that you know, if you're doing your precision experiment and there is some blip or some outlier or something, uh, you know, if you just have one experiment, there's not a whole lot you can do with it. Probably somebody kicked the, you might think someone kicked the apparatus or someone turned the microwave on or something. But if we have um, archive data from a large number of these experiments, and we then, then it's possible to, to look for correlations. You know, if every single experiment that was running on Tuesday at a blip at the same time, then that might be something interesting. And these kind of techniques can easily be applied to this sort of data as well. Um, so, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, 
you could set limits on super crazy large gravitational waves. It's a dumb idea, it's nothing that big, but nobody ever looked. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe Weber did, but uh, he also found supernova in 1987. So maybe it's worth a fresh look. Uh -huh. um, that might be fun. Yeah, yeah. Particularly, so I mean, so I mean, generally speaking, you would want much more precise clocks than the GPS. Yeah. But we have 16 years of data, right? So you maybe have one some of these. That you could look for. Yeah. It's probably ridiculous, but it's probably interesting for perspective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just a, to show, just like at a real quick talk. The other idea is much more serious. Is uh, you could set limits on um, cloak from human spacecrafts. <laughs> 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 So, ah, I mean, there's probably there's probably a lot of parameter space that's still available, right? So this is an idea that you could use for an uh, April Fool's paper, in which the data would be real, the analysis would be real, it's just the data is goofy. So, you know, totally close spacecraft that fly very close to Earth, or, you know, giant worms under the sand or something like that. But they have um, Yeah, okay, but... Well, I mean, in terms of giant worms under the sand, they actually, uh, so the... the the, the data, well, not, not specifically, <laughs> but the, so the, the data that we're using is, is generally used by the geoscience community. Yeah. And they do uh, track things like water movements under the ground and things that sound insane, but it does. Yeah, but do so, you want April Fool's paper? <laughs> you set limits on the global spacecraft. All those papers that get sure. you the title papers on the New York Times. Yeah, that's so, uh, yeah. I mean, you might <laughs> want to consider that. I think. Yeah, for sure. Don't make me throw up. There's a new series coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not so much a question as it is that maybe a comment when you look, when you apply your new methods and you, you're covering orders and orders of magnitude of completely unbroken parameter space. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't want to look at all your data at once. Just a suggestion, you know, like, you know, um, what we call like unblinding steps, right? So mm -hmm. Just do something so, so you don't mess up your trial factor. Okay, yeah. It takes 15 years to collect another 15 years of data. So it, Sure. Yeah. That's, okay. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for our for our main one, I did say this, but like, so we haven't put any real data through the the main code yet, and we won't do that until uh, we're sure that's working. But no, I would just do it in steps, right? You uh huh. Look at yeah. One data, one year of data first. Yeah, for sure. And it, it, find something there, and you can scrutinize that before you look at the other. Yeah. Before you make yours. Yeah. Um, as well as that, actually, because the GPS network, you know, it's twenty years old or something, and it's continuously being improved. Um, in fact, there's a slide here somewhere. Uh, so maybe this is incomprehensible to most people, but the, the, this is the Allen variance. Uh, lower number is better here. So there's a, there's a huge range of orders of magnitude, more than an order of magnitude, in different accuracies of the clocks. So the last year of data is an order of magnitude better than the, the data from 10 years ago. So we can, doing things like that, obviously we're limited in, the, in some ranges of the parameter space, but it does, in some places, give you better limits. Yeah, yeah. So it depends uh, on the size of the signal. If it's big, we can do it very well. Um, so we, we haven't finished running the simulations. Um, so we get the, the velocity reasonably well. The, the direction, like the, the, the incident angle, is, is very, very good, like to better than 10%. Um, depends on. It's not, it's not exactly like super high precision, right? But like we can do these things to about 10%. Uh, so the density we can never do independently of the coupling. Um, but in terms of the coupling with the density, then, then we, we can, yeah. So like the field amplitude times the coupling strength. Can you distinguish a wall from a scheme? Yes, by the correlation. So um, uh, if there's... Uh, anyway, so if, if you have a wall, it's a, a domain wall or something will hit every single clock and it will interact with every single clock for the exact same amount of time. If you have a, domain, if you have a monopole, for example, it may only hit half the clocks and some of them will be glancing and some of them will be uh, head on. So obviously that, that, that's one of the things that makes those signals harder to look for, uh, but in general we can. If it's, if it's a huge monopole or something, it, it, it will be a bit more difficult, but yeah, in general we can. So. Uh Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the ideal choice 
high-tension lasers or um, um, something that is interrogating fast? Yeah, so you do want something that's interrogating fast. I mean, so it, there's a couple of different things. I, I, mentioned, I, I didn't actually mention it. It was on the slide. So these clocks have... Um, so the way an atomic clock works is you have your ensemble of atoms and then you have your... Uh, in, the, in the case of the GPS clocks, it's, a, it's actually a quartz oscillator that is driving your signal. And if something affects the uh, atoms, there has to be some servo time before the, the signal will actually change. Um, so there's things like that. In fact, I, in actual fact, the, the dark matter may affect the quartz oscillator too, so you can have signal down that end. Um, if the clock is integrating for 30 seconds and something passes through, in the middle of that 30 seconds, you will still see a signal just reduced. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, more data is better, right, if you can get the, the clocks to interrogate fast. Uh, one of the problems we have with the GPS is that they're military controlled, so we don't actually, they don't actually release all the details of exactly how the clocks work. Um, laboratory clocks, obviously, are much more uh, well known and controlled. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we haven't specifically done these kind of simulations, but uh, we, we can. Um, so, in, in general, one would expect that these kind of Earth signals would not uh, sort of propagate through in the same way, so we would hope that they wouldn't, um, you know, provide the, so a sort of background that would be relevant, but it is possible. One thing that is, that is potentially relevant is solar wind, because this will travel at... I mean, you can get perturbations of roughly equal, uh, of you know, comparable velocities. Um, but you know, we're hoping that by things like uh, solar wind, obviously comes directly from the sun and doesn't affect satellites in the shadow. Uh, but yeah, so we haven't done that kind of simulation, but we, we can. So once we have the, the GPS simulator working properly, we can plug any kind of signals that we want through. So on slide 11, you demonstrate the modulation of the pulse. How actually? Manage to uh, uh, modulate on the clock in a ten-day sequence, or uh, what type of fashion did you manage to do? Uh, I'm not sure I follow. Uh, sorry. Yes, first slide. Yeah, I think uh, I don't know if the right slide or not, but you demonstrate um, the pulse. I, I'm just wondering if it's in a you know, time sequence or annual variance. Oh, so the annual variation. Yeah. Annual right. Variance. Yeah. So. Um, so again, so we, we, because we haven't finished the simulations, we haven't got to this stage in terms of uh, actually seeing if we can look for an annual variation in the, in the event rate or something. Um, and essentially, it's it entirely dependent on the statistics. So if there is a huge number, if there's like 10 events per day, then we can do this very well. If there's like 10 a year, then obviously we have nothing. But um, if that answers your question. Yeah. Do you have expected signals? I mean, you, you mentioned solar flares, right? If I, or solar wind. If I have a solar flare that comes through, that doesn't really change the, the frequency of your clocks, but you know, it, it'll maybe kick out your electronics or cause erratic signals. And yeah, like I mean, the other things like if it changes the orbits of the clocks, uh, even though it doesn't change, it, it, it's yeah. going to mimic yeah. these kinds so, of things. So, do you have signals that you actually expect? Um, like wrong signals. Well, I would call it a real signal, right? I mean, okay, yeah, like, but it's not I mean, a dark matter signal. It's not a dark matter signal, yeah. but it's something to go after. You have an expectation. You can calibrate your, your network off of it. Yeah, so, I mean, we did once try and look at, like, periods of solar activity and see what we could see in the data, and we will continue to do that sort of thing. At the moment, we don't have those exact models. Um, but in this uh, technique, so uh, this is the sort of the Bayesian framework that we're using. We can feed any S is the signal that we're looking for. We can feed any signal in through the data and try to, and so, you know, we should be able to model those things and, and, and use them to check. So that is something we're thinking about is using, like, existing known, you know, perturbations that were obviously not dark matter to yeah, see if... Are, are there known perturbations, right? Uh, it, it's, it's not 100% it's not clear, but um, there, there should be something. It, it may 